Right, summertime. Good, good morning, uh, church. How you doing this morning? Can we all stand on our feet? Uh, it's good to have you in the house of the Lord this morning. Are you happy to be here? Yes. Amen. Can we just go to the Lord in prayer and just begin this worship service by inviting him into this place and into our hearts and into our minds, our thoughts this morning? I just want to give you one opening thought. Let's turn off everything else that happened before you even came in the room. Just turn it off. And just begin to think about and dwell on his presence in our lives, his meaning in our lives, everything he has, not just for us, but everything he does for us. Even when we don't deserve it, he does it anyway. Amen. Let's just pray. Father, we love you today. We praise your mighty name. We praise your glorious mighty name, Lord Jesus. We ask your presence be in this room today. Let your Holy Spirit just fill us to overflowing. And God, we give you praise and we give you honor. This is what this day is about. is about honoring you and worshiping you and giving you glory. If you be lifted up, Lord God, you said your word, you draw all men unto, unto you. And so, Father, I pray that today we glorify your name. In Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Come on. Come on, let's stir up that gift of worship today, that gift of praise that makes a shift take place in the atmosphere today. Amen. We have the ability to cause a stir and a shifting in the atmosphere today. So let's understand the authority with which we praise today, the authority with which we worship and give him everything that we have. All right, let's do it.
this morning. Come on, let's start up this morning. Can we start out with our hands lifted to the King of Kings? Come on, like we believe it today. We we'll see you break down every wall. Come on. Since we cannot survive when we praise you. God, our breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him up. All creation. Come on, do that again today. We'll see you. We'll see you break down every
heaven. Amen. Let him hear your song once more today. My praise is the highway. Praise is to his heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lord, use our praise. chance for you to respond to his presence. Oh, now the King of Kings has blessed us with his presence already this morning. And he deserves a response. He deserves a response.
say this. Praise is the highway to the throne. Praise is the highway to the heart. Praise is the highway to the Lord. Let's be that church that is committed to making the throne for his presence every time we come together, every day in our homes. Amen? Yes, Lord.
never leave you and he will never forsake you and even when you think you're all alone in that battle he wants to bring you through it and not leave you in it hear me when I when I say this Jesus wants to bring you through it and not leave you in it hear this preacher one more time listen hear me say this there is royalty in your blood if you've accepted Christ as your savior, you have Jesus flowing in you and through you. He, no, he left the throne to come be a sacrifice for you. His blood is atoning, meaning it covers everything. So if you have that, if you need a miracle, raise your hand. Just come on, let me see those hands. Something you can't do on your own. You need Jesus. As you declare these words to this song, God's going to open up miracle windows and doors in your life, allowing you to walk through and get through those next seasons. Somebody say amen. Somebody believe with me today. Come on. Say amen. If that's you, and I don't know about you, but if, if, if you were in this room and you raised your hand, this is your moment for you to get free, for you to have breakthrough. Who needs breakthrough? I mean, everybody's hands should be up. Who needs breakthrough? I need breakthrough. Let's just allow the Lord to come in to our hearts right now in this season that we're in seemingly impossible situations that God wants to overtake and take control of. He wants to lead you through them. He wants to take your hand and lead you through them. Right now is that moment. Are you ready? What's the moment? Here we go.
started our week, however we started last week or even how we started this year, I pray God that you'll interrupt any works of the enemy. And I cast down every enemy in our lives. The weapons of his warfare will not prevail. Every weapon that is formed against us, Christians, those that have called ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ, every weapon that is formed against us will not, shall not prosper in Jesus' name. I defeat the enemy. I defeat Satan in our lives right now. I command the enemy of our lives to flee in Jesus' name. And everybody said in this room, believe with me. Amen. 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 You can be seated. Well, before you're seated, turn to your neighbor. Would you just high five like five or six people? Hug a couple people before you're seated. Let them know you love them, that you're thank, thankful they're here. Amen. 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 Jess is being a little crazy running around. been good to you? Amen. I want to tell you how good he is. Amen. Today I'm going to tell you how good he is. Somebody say amen. Uh, you're not convinced. Today I'm going to tell you how good God really is. Somebody say amen. I'm into the place today to declare that Jesus is Lord of all and he's got everything in control and nothing you deal with or what you go through is impossible for God to deal with. He can help you in every single situation that you find yourself in, no matter how messed up it is or that even that you might have gotten yourself into. God is a good God. He's graceful. He wants to show us grace and mercy and he wants to make today new. Somebody ought to give God praise for that right there. Come on. Hallelujah. Man, getting too excited. Are we too excited this morning? I don't think so. We can't be too excited about Jesus. Amen. Can we give it up for this team today? They did a great job. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Uh, many things to do today. I just want to jump right into the Word of God. Is that okay? Amen. Can you work on, work on this, Luke, or do I need to switch? I can't see you. Do I need to switch? Am I good? Okay. He just waved me off. 
You're good. In the world we have today, so many, so many things that have hit us like a ton of bricks. It can come at you. Life can hit you so hard sometime. Anybody have been hit by life? Anybody had to go through some things? Deal with some stuff? Anybody ever been accused of something? Falsely accused of something? Anybody ever been talked about? Anybody ever been talked about wrongly? I think sometimes we think Facebook's okay, but I just wonder if social media is causing more problems than, you know, a little bit of 101 social media. Stop putting all your stuff out there for everyone to see. And then there will be no more comments. (laughs) But even so, life comes at us so hard sometimes. It feels like there are so many things in the world that are wrong. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about how good will be spoken, evil, evil will be spoken, good. It's upside down. It's an upside down world that we live in where we're supposed to celebrate things that are not of God. And the society causes us, challenges us, sometimes pushes us to celebrate things that are not of God. And so then we get closed in even further into a tighter bubble. Do we compromise what God says in his word or do we do what he says and close off the things that don't belong. Not only the things that don't belong, but the people who don't belong. Not only the, the people who don't belong, but the activities that they're involved in with that don't belong. And I wonder how many times if we were given a decision to be made, if we were to draw a line, everybody knows that you've crossed lines before, right? There's been lines in your life where you're like, the Holy Spirit, you hear this, uh-uh-uh, don't do that. And you could count it as your, you know, as your subconscious mind thinking, well, something in my mind is telling me, uh-uh-uh, don't do that. Or you can consider it as the Holy Spirit speaking to your life, saying, don't cross that line. Because if you cross this line, maybe you've crossed it before, but if you cross it again, The Bible says, turn from sin, turn from your wicked ways, turn away from the line. Sometimes the line is here and we live this, how close can I be to the line and still go to heaven? Do you know what I mean? How close can I get to the edge of the line? I once was a youth pastor, if you can imagine, back in a long time ago. I know, I'm getting old. For those that are older than me, I know I'm still a kid, all right? But how many of you have ever thought, um, where, the, where exactly is the line? When I was a youth pastor, constantly was barraged with questions on Pastor Steve, Pastor Steve. I have a little, little teenagers coming up, bouncing up to me. Hey, Pastor Steve. Some of them go to church here. Hey, Pastor Steve, how far is too far when I'm dating this girl? How far is too far? I mean, is, is holding her hand too far? Is, 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 is hugging her too far? Is kissing her too far? Is holding her too far? How far is too far, Pastor Steve? And I would say, how close do you want to get to the line, my, my friend? Because at that, at that line, you can make decisions. You can be pulled over lines. You could go too far into that relationship, into that thing, into that sin. You could go too far into those things. And I would imagine that some of us today is saying, if I had had done, if I could do it over again. Anybody have that thought in your mind? If I could do that decision over again, I wouldn't have dated that guy. If I could have done that decision again, I wouldn't have went to that place. If I could have done this thing over again, I would have never done that. I wouldn't have made that decision. Y'all remember Blockbuster Video? 
I don't know if there's any more. I think there's one in existence, I think, is what I, I read. Blockbuster video, you know, they have the sections of videos, you know. If you, does anybody, remember, everybody know what that is? You, does anybody not know what that is? Okay, don't, just ask somebody. There used to be a day when we didn't have streaming services and we had to actually go to the video store and rent a large cassette tape called a VHS tape and we would have to put that into a machine and you ever remember, be kind, rewind. You remember what I'm saying? You know. <laughs> and, and we would put it into the machine and we would play the movie. And, and I, remember, I remember that God stopped me one time while I was going into the blockbuster video. And he said, if you can't take your mama with you in there and pick that video out, then you ought not go in. You ought not go to that shelf. You ought not go to that section. You ought not go to that movie. And so every time I thought about that from then on, from then on, a younger age, remember that was a long time ago when we had all that, the Holy Spirit would convict me and he would say, listen, every time, every time you pick a movie, every time you listen to a song, what are you putting in you? Garbage in equals garbage out. What are you inputting into you? What are you committed to putting into you? What are you devoted to putting into you equals what is coming out of you? Love put in equates to love going out. Are you all right? So we know that the world is messed up. There are more abortions than there ever has been even though we've passed laws. There are more, there are more uh, children born out of wedlock than ever before. There are, there are more, there are, there's so many other sins that if I just started p- throwing them all at the wall, everybody would be like, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's me. And if we were to be honest with each other, <laughs> amen, if we were to be honest with each other, if we all knew, what if we all had this ability to know everything that's inside of every person? Oh, <laughs> all your sins are written down all of a sudden right in front of you, like on a computer screen. And, and, and all of a sudden, everybody in this room knew everybody's mess. Oh, I, I see some of you like, it's all good. You wouldn't see nothing. Yeah. The deep hidden thoughts. There's so much out in our lives that we've done wrong, but we have a, we have a gracious, look, we don't deserve that. We don't deserve a second chance. But God gave it to us because he loves us. You, you can't do enough stuff to, to deserve his mercy and grace. He freely laid his life down. No man made him do it. He freely gave it. He could have called 10,000 angels to come in his aid while he was on the cross, but he, he waited and he, he was punished for us. And so the gospel message has been preached in the first three minutes of the service. Here's the answer to every problem you ever face, it's his presence. His presence is what goes into you in your greatest moments of need. You know why we still have to go through stuff? Because we're an imperfect people. Humans failed at the beginning of creation. Mankind fell. Come on, if you don't know the story, let's read Genesis 1 through 3. Here we go. Mankind fell, the great fall, man fell, Adam fell, and then all of a sudden we have rushed in all humankind. We were born unclean. It's hard to, th- it's hard to think. We were born into a place of death, and we need something to rekindle and bring us back and restore us back to life. 
And so today, with all of the world upside down, all of the places we go and the people we encounter, have you had to encounter hell in this, in this world? There has been evil set loose in these last days that would seemingly want to destroy and kill every single thing that is in our lives that is good. And I'm not trying to beat around the bush this morning. I'm trying to get right to the, to the, to the meat of the matter. There'll probably be some funny moments because I just am stupid crazy. But in this moment, I want us to open our hearts up to commitment. And what is that level at? What kind of devotions? And I, I, I heard the Holy Spirit say so, so specifically to me this morning, somebody's switch is going to be turned on today. What takes a person from a, a destitute, desperate situation to a life-giving, joyful place is his presence. It's a commitment to being in his presence. It's a commitment that even when things come at us hard and tough and fast, because they do, right? Shake your heads, they do. I'm going to stay steadfast. I'm not going to turn to the things of this world. I won't turn to drugs. I won't turn to alcohol. I won't turn to, to other things of this world. I will turn to him and him alone. Amen? But I don't know if our children got dismissed. Are they waiting for that still? Are we good? We're good? Okay. It was in secret, incognito. Turn with me, if you will, um, to 2 Corinthians. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, and I'm, I'm going to have it on the screen, but today's message is, is about commitment. Let's read this first. I think this will put things into perspective when you're thinking about the world and how crazy it is and how I, I, heard, I heard a young lady just the other day, she said to me, I don't even want to bring any kids into this world because it's so nuts. You know, your parents were saying that same thing. And then their parents were saying that same thing. The world has fallen. It's not that we need more soldiers to continue to make it good, because listen, eventually this world, as we know it, will fade away. <laughs> and Jesus Christ will come, and we will reign with him for a thousand years, and then we're called up into eternity, and it's going to be on. Fishing, chocolate toffee cake, which I had on vacation, which was amazing, nonstop, and his presence. I think all three of those things go together. But what are you seeking? And I think this is what brings it into perspective. Let's read. Verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed, let me say hard pressed, on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. There's a whole but nots then. There's a lot of he came and saved us, taking care of us. We are always carry, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. And I want to stop right there and just, just get you to understand Teresa said it just a little bit ago. She talked about commitment, commitment. Are we committed? He's committed to living inside of you. Pin drops. Amen. He's committed to living inside of you and helping you through it, taking you to other levels that you've never seen of him. In seasons of despair, he's still moving and taking care of you. Somebody say amen. amen. So that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our bodies. So we can't reveal that ourselves, but because he lives in us, he reveals himself to us. This is good because if you think about in terms of a motion picture, when it stops and goes and stops and goes, the reason why we have motion pictures is because it's taken thousands upon thousands of smaller pictures in a row. 
That's what a shutter does, and it's just constantly rolling, and that's what you see. You all remember what it was like when we had in, high, in school, in elementary, in high school, those that are my age, you'll probably remember this, when you had to bring out the projector and had the reel. Do you, raise your hand so I know what age group I'm talking to. All right. Whew. All right. If you don't know what that is, uh, see me afterwards. Okay, I'll show you. But, but what it is, is it's, it's, it's tiny little pictures. When you see a motion picture at the theater, what you're really seeing is thousands upon thousands upon thousands of little tiny pictures taken. And when Jesus lives on the inside of you, he wants to reveal himself to you. And the Bible says you can't, you can't possibly be able to comprehend who he truly is until he, he reveals himself to you. He wants to reveal himself. And sometimes that's in tiny little bits. Anybody ever have a vision? Anybody have a dream? This is how God works. Prophecy. This is how God works. And so he wants to reveal himself to you. And the only way you can get to know him, come on now, here it is, is to be in his presence. Be where he's at. Now, he lives in you, but listen, he's not, gonna, he's not begging for anything. He's already there. He's already the best thing you ever could have ever imagined. He's not asking, he's not trying to sell himself to you. He's available upon request Let's continue. Verse 11. For we, are, we who are alive are always being given over to the death of Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. Listen, here it is, verse 12. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have been spoken with that same spirit of faith. We also believe, therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present himself, present us with you in his presence. Verse 15, all this is for who? Your benefit. So that what? So that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Why is he revealing himself to you? And this is the message, to show you grace. We have this picture of what a heavenly father looks like. And we sometimes taint that picture with what an earthly father looks like. He's not an earthly father. He's a heavenly father. He's a holy, right, and just father who shows an immense amount of grace and mercy. And he also holds in his right hand the greatest power of the universe. No one, nothing is more powerful than our one true God. Nothing. So if he holds all the power of the universe in his right hand... And he decides that if you would just spend time with me, I will reveal to you. I'm not even close to my message for the day. This is all free. He wants to reveal to you today his immense amount of grace and mercy. And I come by today to say to you, stop being so hard on yourself. Because Christ has already forgiven you. Of your mess. You're messed up. I'm messed up. We're all messed up. We can go to the garden, eat worms, yum, yum. Or we can stand on his word and be forgiven and have grace and mercy abound in us. There was a reason he went to the cross. And it wasn't so that you could have a pity party. It was so that you could be victorious in your life. I thought I'd get... A greater response there. Can we just give God a hand clap of praise? 
He says in verse 15, this is, this is the truth. He says, this, all this is for your benefit. This is your perk. This is for you. This is all for you. Verse 16. Hear me out real quick. You guys with me still? Yes. Therefore, we do not lose heart. What happens when we go through life is we start losing our hearts. Amen. Stop losing your heart. You don't have to lose your heart. What we need is a transplant. What we need is some surgical stuff done to our heart. We need something to be taken out so that he can put some new stuff in. Do you ever hear the term make room in your heart for? Make room in your heart means you have to get rid of some stuff. I have a room in my house. It's called the storage room. (laughs) Do you know what a storage room really ends up being? A junk room. Anybody have one of these in their house? Maybe you have multiple of them. A junk drawer. Anybody have a junk drawer? Raise your hand if you have a junk drawer. Ra- okay, put your hands down. Anybody in this room have junk drawers? Plur- plural? Raise your hand up. Who has more than two junk drawers? Who has a place where things go when you don't know where else they go? It's called the Tupperware drawer. I don't know where all that stuff even goes. Why do we have 72,000 containers and like two lids? I don't understand this. You understand you know what I mean? I, it got so bad that one Christmas I ended up getting my wife an entire new set glassware. And then we have glassware and we don't know which lids go with what. We have no idea. So we just end up using saran wrap. You know what I'm talking about? But we all have places that we store our junk and we keep it too full. I'm not talking about physical stuff. Let's, let's not talk about that. But it's much like that. We keep putting stuff in there that doesn't really make sense. That we should take that stuff out so we can put things in that do make sense. Does make sense. Taking things and removing things from a place that God created for him to live inside of us should be, should be elementary as a Christian disciple. But what we do is we say, well, I got a little bit of sliver of room. I'm going to shove in some more stuff or more people, or more relationships, more things, vices, stuff that I, I'm going to put that in there instead of him. And what he's really saying to you this morning And this is the message from the preacher at the Potter's House in Mansfield, Ohio, for you today, for you to understand, is I want you to remove things that don't make sense and put things in that were made to go in there. And that's his presence. And listen, when he comes in, it's like the Grinch. He will come in and expand Grinch's heart grew three times that day. You know what I'm talking about? He will make room where there seemed to be no room. He will make you have more compassion towards others. He will, he, will, he will shine inside of you. He will give you more joy than you thought you ever could have. He will give you grace and mercy that will abound in your heart. I, I call it the thing that makes you move. You give me more joy... God, you're saying you're going to give me more joy? More joy in the Bible equates to strength. The Bible says that his joy is our, I heard one person say it, strength. It's what keeps you going. It's what motivates you in times of trouble. It's what keeps pushing you onward even when you don't feel like it. His joy, which is, becomes your strength and can motivate you to press forward, even in the midst of adversity, even in the midst of turmoil, your, his joy will move you and motivate you forward. That only comes after you've been totally sold out and forgiven. And that only comes when you surrender and you repent. Surrender and repentance ushers in joy. Hey, you just gave up some stuff. Come right this way. I'm going to take you right to the joy that you need. Come right over here. Have a seat. Here's your strength. So may give God praise because that was pretty good, I thought. 
Let's continue. Verse 17, so for our light and momentary trouble are achieving us for an eternal glory that are far outweighs, that far outweighs them all. Verse 18, so we fix, somebody say fix, our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is what? Temporary. Temporary. But what is unseen is what? eternal. I wanted to start at the scripture because I wanted to to stay in this mode of what does it mean to be renewed. I looked it up. The Bible says to be renewed is to make like new. Dictionary, the dictionary definition is to restore to freshness, vigor, or perfection. As we renew our strength in sleep, this is what the dictionary said, to make new spiritually or to regenerate. I loved the dictionary's version of this when it talks about being renewed because it talks about strength in sleep. What is sleep? What is sleep? I'm not asking for an answer, I'll tell you. Sleep is rest. Sleep is regeneration. Your cells in your body can regenerate. Your muscles can relax in such a way. There is a certain type of sleep that you only get to after you go into a deeper mode of sleep. I have a hard time doing this. I don't believe she's in the room. She's not. Thank you. All right. My daughter likes to still come and jump and sleep in our bed. (sighs) Pray for me. It's tough. It's a rough world. And she likes to do the whole kickaroo thing. And so right when I get to that moment of deep sleep, I get a knee to the rib. Anybody know what that is? All right. Parents all know. Kids are like, what? I don't know. Whatever. I used to be able to sleep through some stuff like that. But deep sleep, once you get into the deep sleep and you get kicked in the rib, you don't go to deep sleep for the rest of the night. What I'm saying to you today is there is a place that God wants to take us to a deep, deep place of rest and peace. And that, and that, that truly is only found, it's only found when you're in his presence. Somebody high-five your, na- high your neighbor and tell him, in his presence. The meaning of today's sermon totally is about commitment. And being committed to something means that you're going to have to do stuff that you didn't do before to get different results that you've never, ever seen before. So when when we follow Jesus, we cannot give up in following Jesus. We have to continue to persevere, dare to persevere, dare to overcome. Listen, the, the great late Apollo Creed once said, There is no tomorrow, Rock. There is no tomorrow. Meaning you have to continue to persevere through all of the trouble, through all of the things that you go through. And for some of us, those troubles have derailed us in such a way that we're not able to even keep going. We're off the tracks. And so what it is is we have to take inventory. We have to find some help. That's what it means. When you've derailed, when you've come off the tracks, when you're no longer seeking him, when you're stuck in a rut, whatever you want to call it, you have to get back to where it all started. And that help comes from the Lord, but that help also comes through people that are used of the Lord to bring you back onto the track and then you make the decision to follow him. God is wanting us to make life-changing, daring, challenging decisions to follow him and make a commitment to follow him even when we don't feel like it. Stop living in your feelings. Feelings will lie to you. I know I've said that before, but there's people in here that have never heard me say that. Feelings have a tendency... No, they always lie to you. They lie to you. You can feel this way one moment, 
And this way the next moment. You can feel good. You can feel bad. You can feel like you can fight this thing. You can feel exhausted. Feelings come and go. They're driven by emotions. That's an emotion. I'm having a feeling of, I feel like this. I wish we would stop saying that. How do you, you know, somebody would ask, always, how you doing? I feel pretty good. When my body's about to fall apart and everything in the world's about to fall apart, I, I'm feeling pretty good. The truth of the matter is your feelings will lie to you. They'll keep you derailed. Because feelings are emotions, they'll keep you derailed because you'll start to tell yourself, you'll start to listen to the enemy. Wish I could run back to my pre-Easter message and say this. You'll sit at the table with the enemy and you'll start listening and believing what he's saying about you. You're not good enough. You're not able. You've done too many bad things. How could you ever be good enough? And the enemy wants you to believe those lies so that you will be isolated and kept away from where you need to go. The journey is not about where you go. The journey is about how you get there. How do you get there? It's not with your, cha- it's not with your unchanging hand. It's with his unchanging hand. He's never thought any, any different about you. You're his child. He cares about you. He's never thought any worse of you. You're his son or his daughter. He wants you back if you've left him, if you've been derailed, if you've come off the tracks. He just wants to jerk you back on so that you can keep on going. Do this with me, church. Put your hands out in front of you and do this with me. Chugga, 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 chugga. Come on. Chugga, chugga. I am not hearing you. Chugga, chugga. You're not doing it. Get back on the track. Come on, somebody. Get back on the track. If it takes that, man, me humiliating myself and standing up in here and saying, get back on the tracks, it's saying, stop staying where you're at and being okay with it. It's not okay to be derailed. It's okay to stay there for a minute, but help is on the way. Somebody say, help is on the way. My, my brother, he works for a major railroad company. He's a vice president of a major railway, railway company. He loads trains. Millions and millions of stuff get put on his trains, and they go from place to place. And the one thing he's had to deal with more than anything this last year is when trains derail. When trains derail, they, call, they cause massive, massive amounts of damage, not only to personal life, but to stuff, businesses, to all kinds of different things. Causes massive damage to the surrounding communities. He was heavily involved in the, in the derailings that were in, in the east part of Ohio. And the one question he was asked, why did it happen? You know why it happened? Neglect of the people who are operating the trains. The number one reason why trains derail is because they're neglecting the way they operate the train. Maybe, just maybe, the reason why your train has been derailed is because of a decision that you have made that has caused everything in your life to completely come off the rail. What God is saying is whatever you messed up, I want to fix and restore and renew. God is in the renewal business. Aren't you glad about that? God is in the fixing business. Aren't you glad about that? God has an insurance policy for you and his name is Jesus. Now all you have to do is allow him to come in, take over, move your thing back on the rail and let it go chasing after him. I don't know about you, but I am not willing to go down any more feeling tracks. Feeling tracks are just one-way pits to hell. Spur tracks is what we call them in the railroad business, but if you if you're to go down a spur track long enough, guess what? It ends up in the dirt. Stop going off track. Committed. Who's ready to be committed? 
to this relationship that is life-giving? Who's ready to be committed to the power that's greater than anything in the universe? Who's ready to be committed to that? So I I keep hearing the Lord saying in these last days that there's an urgency in the air. There's a maturity that has to come. It's a mandate for us to grow up in the Christ and stop drinking on the milk of the word and to, to jump into the meat of the word. You're going to start hearing this preacher talk more about meat than milk. Milk is down there in the nursery. It doesn't belong in the sanctuary. Although from time to time, we have to get bottles out. This, that sounds really horrible. We have to get bottles out, but that's just to make sure that you're nourished so that you're able to truly make commitment. Not everybody that walks into this room is mature in Christ, and that's okay. We have been called, somebody say called, to be disciples of Jesus. This means that we're called as a life sentence of perseverance, a life preservance of, and to be steadfast and determined to follow Christ, no matter the cost. I used to say, people would ask me all the time, what do you, what do you expect from the church? And I say, well, I will do whatever it takes to make sure people get to Jesus all the way up to jail. I will do whatever it takes, whatever cost, it, 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 whatever I have to do to make sure that people follow Christ. That's not my job. That's the Spirit's job. You're convicted and called of the Holy Spirit. If you're convicted and called of the Holy Spirit, that's when the light switch turns on. I can't turn it on for you. But you can definitely ask for his Holy Spirit to turn on the switch. What makes somebody go from being being bound to to hell in in, an unforgiven world in a a terrible place and evil is abounding, what turns them from that to this is this Holy Spirit. Hear me out. Listen. Listen real close. I I once met a guy. uh, I used to live in Willard, Ohio. Grew up there. My wife and I both grew up there. I I met this guy in high school, and he was the biggest bully. I was just a, I I just was like a fun-loving kid, you know, just running around, doing whatever, loving everybody. Tried to sit at the popular table, tried to sit at the regular table. Ended up just sitting where people actually cared about me. There was one kid who was very athletic, and I will not mention his name because he knows me now, and we, we, we talk all the time. He was a big bully in my life. He was my thorn in the flesh. And I used to think, why did God make this guy? You know, anybody know one person like that? You know what I'm talking about? Don't shake your heads too much. Jeez. He's the biggest, meanest dude that I've ever met. And I I just don't want to be around him. Years later, right? Something happened to him. It caused him to give his heart to Jesus. And he was completely changed. He didn't even talk the same. He didn't act the same. He didn't even really look the same. His countenance had changed. His face, facial expressions had changed. He was a totally excited person. Back then he was miserable, uh, you know, nasty person, always cussing and saying things. He was, he was a miserable person then. What I'm saying to you is that Jesus came into his heart and changed him completely. And when I saw him just a few years ago when he finally gave his heart to Christ... I thought, I don't even want to talk to this guy. Why is he coming towards me? What is going on? I'm trying to get out of this conversation. And he comes up to me, runs up to me, and gives me a hug. Have you ever been hugged by who you thought was a spawn of Satan? (laughs) I'm just saying, I thought you were his child. I didn't know. He says, man, I've been watching you online. I've been praying, and I'm different. My heart has changed. Something on the inside of me is new. And I'm not that same guy. So listen, he said, so listen, forgive me. Because I didn't know. 
I didn't know I could be different. And since I've accepted Jesus in my life, I live for him. I, I go to church. My whole family's in church. Uh, they're all excited about God. They love Jesus. They've all accepted Christ in their heart. And it says, all because of what Christ did in his life. It was a switch that the Holy Spirit flipped on. So maybe you're here in this room and you're listening to this message or maybe you're watching online and you're hearing this preacher. Let the Holy Spirit speak to, speak to him, talk to him. Let the Holy Spirit flip that switch on in your life and open up a whole new world that you never thought could be possible. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, you'll stop acting like the world and start acting like Christ. A couple more things. Are you okay? It's good because I haven't been up here very long, so you're all right. There is an urgency, I believe, in these last days in the air. We have been called to be disciples. How faithful, here's the question, how faithful is God to you? I mean, even when you didn't deserve it, he like, ah, you know. It's like when my daughter asked me when we were in the store. We were in the store on vacation this past week, and, and uh, I said no, but I was almost at a, I almost went to a yes, Bobby. I almost went to a yes. Um, I'm the dad that gives the daughter the sugar. <laughs> that's, that's me, man. There, Eric, you're, you're my guy. So my, my, my in-laws were with us, and, uh, and they're always super hypersensitive about, and they should be. I mean, that's, you should not give your children tons of sugar. That's my public service announcement for right there. I'm going to end it there and just say, this dad, ice cream, lollipops, whatever you want, babe. I mean, literally, if it's not going to ruin your dinner, which usually it does. And so we went, we're running into the store, and, they, and you know how they do at stores. They put the huge displays of sugary items low enough so that all children in the world could see them, and so that you see this item, and you're like, oh, you know, the kids are just like, look at all the colors, and it's got to taste good. You know, I want it. And she saw these giant lollipops. You know what I'm talking about? Giant lollipops. And the first thing she says, Daddy, do you think I can have that? And I'm like, uh. dude, I was at a yes. But something inside of me said, probably not. And she's like, but daddy, their little eyes, you know, I was like, ah, oh. and this is what dads do. You know, if your mom's okay with it, then you can go ask your mom. If your mom's okay with it, babe, you can have that. I'm telling daddy said that you could have that if mommy's okay with it. And that's when she just goes, because she know mommy's not going to be okay with that. And so she runs off and she finds something else and she ended up buying something else anyway, but it wasn't, it wasn't candy. What I'm saying to you is this, God wants to give you good things, things that will take care of you and nourish you and bring you back to health. That's why the Bible talks about rest. That's why he talks about giving you seasons of rest. It's important for us to rest in him. It's important for us to, to, to know, look, you can stay up all night in, in your guilt and your shame of, of whatever you've done, whatever has happened, or you can rest in peace, grace, and mercy. I don't know about you, but that, that bed sounds a lot better than the other bed. You know what I'm talking about? And, and, so, and so today, we can persevere because... Because of our commitment. Two things and I'll be done, I'm, I promise. Paul talks about a massive treasure in the scripture. The treasure that he's talking about is Jesus himself. I want everybody to consider in the next few moments that Jesus is your gift that you've been given. 
Much like at Christmas time when you run down the steps or into the, the, the area where your Christmas tree is and you see all the presents as a kid, your eyes just blow up, you know, you're just so excited. That's what Jesus is for us on a daily basis. Jesus is requesting that we just spend time with that gift. Okay, two people got me. Jesus is asking He's commanding. He's telling us, spend time with this gift. So what, 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 what the treasure that Paul is talking about is, is the Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. It is a treasure of Christ's sacrifice for us. He has sacrificed this so that we could have this treasure in jars of clay. It is the treasure of salvation that we have, the treasure that cannot ever be fully comprehended. I don't get your love, Lord. Why would you love, the song says, a wretch like me? I once was lost, but now I'm found. It's impossible for me to fully comprehend that kind of love and sacrifice, that kind of gift that would say you once were bound for hell and now you're bound for heaven. That's an excitement that comes inside of me when I think about how temporary this life truly is. We will be with him very soon, forever. It is a treasure of a savior. Look, in this life, we're going to have trouble. Some may say we're going to have trouble. But Christ helps us in our distress. We're going to have trouble. There's going to be days when we don't feel like we can make it through it. You know, when you go through something traumatic, have you ever heard somebody say, well, time will heal all wounds? Now, it sometimes takes a long time. And I'm not saying it heals all wounds. But time is a big, big part in the ability for God to continually pull us towards him. When you go through something really bad, what do you do? You feel defeated, right? And you feel like there's no way out. There's no way back. There's no way I can get to the next moment. I feel defeated. When you go through something that's so horrific, God wants you to know that when, even when you go through those moments, he's with you. I'm holding you got you. You're not going to fail. I'm going to get you through it. We're going to make this, we're going to make this through. We're going to get through this. The trouble that you're having to endure is just but for a season. A season is a, a period of time. I'm going to get you through this season of time. And then I'm going to bring you to, guess what he does? A new season begins. What God doesn't do is he doesn't live in your past. He's in your present and he's in your future. You should not live in your past either because his spirit lives inside of you. If his spirit lives inside of you, you live in the present and in the future. Problem is we, we have a tendency to dwell on things that have already taken place in history, meaning we can't go back. But we continually are pulled and kept back from our present, from our future. Now, how many of you know that you could be sitting in a place like you are right now and you're stuck in your past? Because your mind's in the past. I'm thinking about the past. I'm thinking about the things that I did. You know how I know that? When I drew the line and I said, hey, if you could go back and make one decision over God, not to be with that guy, not to do that thing, a ton of you just went, oh. That's what the enemy does. He shoves us into our past so that we can't move forward into our future. Shame, guilt, all part of your past. Grace, mercy, forgiveness is in your present and your future. Walking boldly and confidently does not happen when you focus on the rearview mirror. It only happens when you're focused, hyper-focused on him and you keep your eyes on him. That's why the song says he is the lifter of our heads. Why? 
And I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to diagnose this or tear it and try to somehow give give you some sort of a, a prognosis on why you're, why things are happening in your life. But I wonder a lot of times when we're focused on our phones, our heads are. A lot of a, Did you know that there is a disorder in people's necks that is starting to come more and more common as people are doing this? And they're I literally, I was on vacation the other day, and this lady, stand up, Bobby. This lady, she just was like this the whole time. She's like, oh, excuse me. And then she had the goal to say this. I didn't see you there. I said nothing, Sean. I said nothing. I, I said zero things. And, I, and then I just finally said, it's okay. And I got out of her way and she kept walking. I got out of her way. Like I stood to the side and then she just went, okay. And she kept walking. As if, you could be seated. Thank you, Bobby. Everybody give Bobby a hand. All right, that's enough. He doesn't get that much hand. Bobby was me, and I was the, the young lady. She, her head was down. She was not focused, on, not focused on me at all. She was focused on whoever, whatever, inside of her imaginary world of social media, whatever. It's all imaginary. It's made up. It's none of it's real. It's not real. You may post something every now and then, and somebody will be like, Oh, how cute. Most of it's like, can't believe this. But focused like this in such a way that she couldn't even see the, am I that small that you cannot see? I mean, I, can you see me behind this camera? I'll suck it in, hold on. Can you see me? It's not hard to miss. Not hard to miss. But she could not see me. She even uttered those words. Sorry, I didn't see you there. But what blows me away, and this is where the rubber meets the road, we will walk around distracted and allow the enemy to blind us on the things that God has called us to. What direction are you headed today? What things are you most committed to today? What things will you say, hey, you know what? Me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord and we're going to be in church. Sorry for those that are watching online. Come to church. <laughs> Truth. Just get here. You can't experience it like you experience it here. You just can't. Jesus wants to lead you and guide you. But you're, if you're not even looking at him, he's the lifter of our... But if we're focused on our past, how can we be focused on him? Focusing on your past does a couple things. It makes you go within yourself. Focusing on your past makes you feel like you're not worthy, like you're not good enough. Focusing on the things, the mistakes that you've made in the past makes you feel shameful and guilty, makes you keep your head down. Most people who are ashamed of themselves, they walk around like this. Trying to avoid, don't, don't want to don't talk to her. She might actually say something that make me feel good. I don't want that. I want to feel bad. Eeyore is your greatest example. Okay. I, I'm, I'm just tired of being around Eeyores. I wanted some Tiggers in my life. You know what I mean? Don't be an Eeyore. Matter of fact, people that need help don't need Eeyores. They need Tiggers. We love Eeyores. Eeyores are fun to be around. Eeyores cause us to be, uh, Eeyores cause us to be more like Eeyores. What a weird name. But we need some tiggers and poos. 
some optimism, not pessimism. We need some life. We need some focus. We need some positive things in our life. God is ultra positive. He's not thinking about the bad things you've done. He says he cast your sins as far as what? The east from the west. And if you know how far that is, that is a long way. Matter of fact, never see again. Forgets that. He's the only one that can forget that. Because he created everything. Let me focus you back for a second. Just one, one last thing and I'll be done, I promise. Are you okay? Has this helped? The Bible says we are hard-pressed, which is to be squeezed, oppressed, hedged in or, and or pressured. Meaning Paul is saying we are not crushed, which is to be in distress on every side, in every place, in every way. We might find ourselves in troubled times, but... Everybody say but. I got everyone in this room to say but. That was weird. But... We are never beyond the assistance of God and how much he can give. God never leaves us without hope. Last, last thing, and I'm going I'm to bring it home here. We may be perplexed, but Christ's power keeps us from despair. And that is good. We may be perplexed. I don't know, God. Desperate people will do, do things that they ought not do. Desperate people will reach into places and do things and be with people and say things and, 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 and react to things. Did you know life is not about how you act? Because I act a certain way. If I know I'm going into a situation with Bobby, hey, Bobby, I love you. What's up? But if Bobby comes at me and I didn't realize it and he knocks me in the mouth how am I supposed to react to that? It just happened. Reaction is usually something that's spontaneous. You know how I really know who you really are? It's how you react, not how you act. It's how you react to things. And if you've been punched in the mouth by life, if someone has caused you pain, it's about how you react to that versus how you act right now. Action, how you act right now is stuff that is in the, it is in the very present. I know, I know where I'm going to go eat this afternoon. I've already picked it out. I'm ready to go. I got it. But if life changes and I have to eat at McDonald's, I might react differently. You know, wasn't expecting this. Like, why am I here? I don't want to go there. I want to go here. If something happens to us in our life that causes us pain, a lot of times we want to react in a way that's adverse to the way that God wants you to react. It is opposite of how God wants to, you to react in those situations. So 90% of your life is how you react. My wife says I have a, have a heavy foot on the brake, not the gas, the brake. And we were on vacation, I'm driving the car, and I hit the brake a few times, <laughs> caused their heads to hit the... You know, they hit the headrest in the back. You know, I, I, I don't want to get in an accident and I'm real careful, but sometimes I'm heavy foot on, oh, whoa, would I jerk the car and everybody's freaking out, you know? It's how that you react to certain things. Do you have a knee jerk reaction or how are you reacting to the things that are tearing your very existence apart? The Bible says that Jesus said in the word in John 10, 10, he said, the enemy has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. That life more abundantly is an action. Because of what the devil said, Jesus has a reaction. His reaction is to give you life. Because of what the enemy wants to do to you, Jesus said, guess what? I trump the enemy and the steal, kill, and destroy. I want to give you life instead of death. So no matter what you find, what situation you find yourself in, you cannot stay off the track. You cannot be derailed. You must be committed to being in his presence. Committed to being in his presence. Stand with me, if you will. Paul goes on to say that you may be 
persecuted. But Christ never forsake us. We're going to serve communion right now. I don't want to get you guys prepared for that. We'll get our hearts and minds ready. Maybe you're in this room and you've never accepted Christ. Come on down, guys. Let's get this, get this out to everybody. Maybe you've never accepted Christ. Persecution comes in many forms. Isolation, criticism. Has anybody ever been criticized about something, a decision you made? All right, all right. Threats. The Bible says that you're never forsaken. Somebody say that with me. I am never forsaken. Praise God. Isaiah 43, 2 says, God never leaves us alone. He is with us always. And there, when we need him, Christ is there to give us his presence and his power. Isaiah 43, 2 says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Is that on the screen? Yeah. Look at that. Let's read it together. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. You may be knocked down, but we are never destroyed. Hear me, church. You may be knocked down, but you are never destroyed. Let's just pray before we receive communion this, this morning. Dear Jesus, if there be one in this room that has not accepted you as Savior, has not understood fully this power that I'm talking about of grace and mercy, I pray, God, right now, that you will save their soul and they will make a commitment to you today, that they will be committed to you today and not the world. So let's pray this prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me. Make me whole. Make me new again. In Jesus' name, I call you Savior of my life. Thank you, Lord. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he was sitting with his friends. And he had a cup in one hand and he had bread in the other. And he said, this bread, go ahead and get the wafer out if you will. It's right on the top. This bread is my body that was bruised for you. It was beaten for you. This is my body, which would be sacrificed for you. And he took the bread and he blessed it. So let's pray over this way for Father. Come in now. Jesus, help us to remember the sacrifice that you made. Of giving your life so that we might have peace and love, security, that we might have, that we might find you and your presence to give us joy and hope. Help us today, Lord God, to remember your body and what you did for us, your bruising and the beating and the death on the cross. Bless this bread as we remember that as your body in Jesus' name. You may break the bread and eat it. In the same way, he took the cup and peel that back. They said, This is the blood, this represents the blood of, of my life for you. This represents the covering of all of your sin and all of your wrongdoings, all of your shame and guilt will be covered by this blood that was shed for you. This is his covenant, the covenant of his blood for you. 
Somebody say Jesus. Just say Jesus. Is it that name? Bring peace into your life. When you just begin to speak Jesus. You know, there's been a lot of times in my life where I didn't know what to say or what to pray. And I just said his name until I got it, until I got what I needed. So just say that with me, Jesus. Jesus, come on. For somebody here today, that's going to become real to you. Just say Jesus. Jesus. He held up the cup and he prayed just like he did over the bread. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, God, right now that this cup, which represents your blood, would be made real in our lives and cover us, cover our homes and our children, cover the sin. And so we remember what you did on that cross by spilling your blood out so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. Bless this cup in Jesus' name. Go ahead and drink. Can we, for just the next few moments, nobody leave, nobody moving around. Service is not concluded. I have a few things I want to share with you, but can we just for a moment, just for like, for like, like 60 to 120 seconds, can you just worship the Lord with us? And just make this commitment that you've, said you want to make. I want a new I want a new season to start. I need a light switch to be switched on. I want to make a bigger commitment to you, Lord. I may be knocked down. I may be perplexed. I may be persecuted. I may be going through it, but God, you're with me. That commitment is real. And I'm going to make that commitment today. Would you just worship the Lord for his sacrifice for you? Just just take some time worship with us. you and you're committed, would you just raise your hand? I'm committed to him. 
I put my faith in Jesus. If that's you, just raise your hand way up. Let Jesus see it. I don't care to see it. Let him see it. I put my faith in him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Can we just give God a big hand clap? He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Amen. Be seated for just a moment. I'm sorry. Just be seated for a moment. Uh, Y'all act like you were the one that worked. I'm the one that was up here standing up the whole time. (laughs) Uh, Ushers, you will come and give us an opportunity to give. Come on down. We're going to give unto the Lord. I want you to prepare your offering, your tithes unto the Lord this morning. I want us to be committed. Committed doesn't, doesn't just mean you're committed to in word or in deed. It means that you're committed time, talent, treasure. Giving to the Lord is a way of showing love. This is a way of we receive in what God is giving us, what God has put in you. God gives us way more than what we could even possibly imagine or even need. We're at a very, very blessed people, a very blessed people, living way beyond sometimes our very needs. And so I want to ask you today to be diligent, to be committed, not just to coming to church, not just to serving in the church, but to also be giving in the church. So this is your opportunity. As you prepare your tithes and offerings, as we get ready to give, I do have some things I want to share with you. Um, coming up is uh, Father's Day. We have a men's brunch that's coming up. A very special brunch is planned September. I'm sorry, September. That would be a few months away. June 17th. My vision is off a little bit. Uh, at 1130. I'm sure it's on the screen. A men's brunch for all those to come. Anybody who is a man can come. That would be great. All ages. And we want you to attend that. Uh, Immediately after service, somebody say right after service, we are having, listen, you don't even have to go out and find any food. If you just want to do a donation, that's fine. But we're trying to raise money for our kids to go to to kids camp. Um, it's very expensive this year. It has been for the last couple of years. Um, things, have, prices of things have just went way up. So we want to make sure we get all of our kids to kids camp. It's not too late to sign up for kids camp. I want to. I want to bring my son down here real quick. He didn't know I was going to do this. Luke, come here, hurry. When I say hurry and I say Luke, he's just like, eh. <laughs> I'll hurry. But no, I'm very proud of Lucas. Um, I was going to make him say something, but I think that he would probably not. Um, Lucas is a product of Kids Camp and his wife as well. Uh, Kylie, stand up, Kylie. A product of Kids Camp. They actually met each other at youth camp, which is pretty cool. Um, right? That's the story, right? You sticking to it? All right. Um, when Luke was little, he was probably hand his age, about eight or nine years old. He he went to the he went to kids camp life changing would you agree lucas that kids camp is life changing life altering for for any kid any teenager that's, that wants to go to youth camp it's life altering uh, many many moments uh, late at night praying and seeking the lord services that are geared just for them we want to see our kids go to kids camp and if you feel led to do so please take an envelope and and put a special offering in today, above your tithes, above your regular offering, put that in the tie, put that in an envelope, and we will ensure that that gets to our kids so they, they can go to camp. Several kids are going to camp this year. It is a financial burden. Some families have multiple children. Uh, Dace and Jessica have like at least 102 two kids. 902 kids, that's a lot. They have nine. It's a big old house full of kids and people. A lot of beds and things. Uh, so we want to make sure that we can help in any way. Not just, I'm not just speaking about that. We want to make sure that we can help every kid get to camp, no matter their situation. So uh, I just would say I'm so proud, Kylie and Lucas, and who they are. They're obviously, they're, they're our kids. And I just want to say um, uh, the, the camp works. Camp works. And it's an experience that kids can have. We want to make sure that all our kids get to camp. So I want to say that before we receive the offering today so that if you feel led of the Holy Spirit to give in an offering for the kids, we want to do that. But right after service, everybody say right after service, 
we are serving hot dogs for kids to go to camp. So you don't have to get a hot dog. It's donations only, so whatever you want to give. Um, it's like $25 a hot dog. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we want you to give whatever you have. We will give you a hot dog. You give us a quarter, we give you a hot dog. All right? But we want to make sure that our kids get to camp. Is that okay? Just sharing that information. Thank you, Luke. Everybody give Luke a hand.